Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Sam Dever Podcast, episode 37. In this episode, I speak with producer, entrepreneur, and activist, Anude. Anude is someone I met in Las Vegas several years ago, and every time he and I would talk, we would always have a phenomenal, deep conversation. And we haven't talked in a while, so it was an absolute treat to be able to catch up with him tonight. I really look forward to you hearing this conversation. The book of the episode is going to be a book actually a new day told me about years ago, the book of Enoch. It's, it's it has to do with the Bible. It's like an extended version of the Bible. I won't get into too much detail, but it talks of the Nephilim and uh, the giants that walked the earth. And uh, Onide had been telling me this about this book, and I immediately went out and got it. And I actually need to reread this. But again, the book of the episode, the book of of Enoch. And without further ado, here's my conversation with a new day. A new day. Welcome Hi, to bro. the Sam Dever podcast. My guy, Sam Dever. How are you, my friend? Oh my gosh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm amazing, bro. Life's good. I mean, life's crazy, I guess, in a, a global aspect, but personally, life is good. And you know what, man, like I'm just thinking back to all of our times back in Vegas several years back and conversations we had. You're one of those people too, man. I had some crazy deep conversations in the most random of places <laughs> <laughs> in Vegas in particular. I remember one time uh, we were downtown. We did an interview, I think, for the social media show with you. And you and I went to some bar. I can't remember what bar it was. It was somewhere downtown. We just started talking about religion and the Bible and all this. And you look at me you're like, Yo, man, have you ever heard of the book of Enoch? I'm like, the book of what? You're like, you've never heard of the book of Enoch? And you broke down the Nephilim and like, <laughs> like all this yeah, stuff. Baby. And it's like, you've always been a guy, man. Like, I really just like, yeah. He, he's one of the people I talk to, you know, even if we haven't spoken in a while and you've been places, I've been places. I'm looking and I'm looking on your Instagram. You're over here in New York. You're in Africa. You're like all over. I'm like, okay, I just... I just need to catch up with him. <laughs> That's really how I'm viewing this podcast, man, because you have me curious to what you've been up to. Well, life's been crazy, you know, knowing from where I came from, you know, I really was focused on my music career and production mm -hmm. and writing and doing that, um, which I still dabble in. I still produce. I still write. You know, I still collect my checks from there. But I really... I really kind of went into this place where I hit my 30s and I really didn't know what the hell I was doing anymore. Wasn't sure what direction I wanted to take things. And so I just really decided that like, I had to expand my knowledge, my experience, my understanding of really the world because that's really all of our governance, all our technology, just the way that we operate as a society in general now is really going, going to be more global than it's ever been. Um, so I just took the time to really just start traveling. I decided I was going to film a documentary and that's evolved in so many different ways. And then along that path, really, I ended up in Africa and really my strategy for how I think I wanted to approach my life personally and approach the way that I view the world changed. And that's really just put me on a completely different trajectory than I was on before. So life's been crazy over the last couple of years, man. It's been, it's been a wild ride. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. And I'll mention in there real quick. Yeah. You're an amazing music artist. And when I first met you, I know you were really pushing that. Um, and so I guess maybe take me through what's been happening then. I, what, what, so what, Tell me about the documentary. As I did see you post about that. I did see you post about the yeah. documentary and you were in Africa. Can you give us a little insight to what exactly that project is about? So the documentary call is called Love Hate Humanity. Um, really what I was trying to discover is the effects that modern technology have on the extremes of our emotion as an individual and as a society so sociologically sociologically and psychologically mm. and so you know when we, we talk about social media we talk about artificial intelligence we talk about now our interaction with robotics you know how is that how how does that exchange affect how we express love how we express express hate 
And so that was really what the key idea for the documentary was. And my goal was to travel the world, get different experiences from different cities. Um, what I learned very, very quickly in that process is how much more work and effort actually goes into that process, specifically when you're trying to capture a society's current economical state and how educated they are and how in use certain technologies are in their community, you really have to spend a lot of time there. I really discovered that and realized that when I was in Freetown, which is the capital of Sierra Leone in Africa. And so what I decided to do is that I think I'm going to break down the documentary into episodes um, and, you know, focus a whole hour and a half specifically on Sierra Leone specifically on Uganda or Nigeria, on these different locations. And I think I'm really going to focus more so on West Africa than I am going to focus globally because there's solutions that could be provided there mm. that it's not a matter of how difficult the solutions are. The solutions are actually very easy. Um, they're just expensive and people just aren't there doing them but they're doing them in other regions in the world. So now my focus is a lot less, a lot less on the actual documentary and how I can actually serve in that region to bring the attention and bring the um, opportunities there from whether from the States or the Western world that we can now. That's amazing. And, and um, I guess one question, what's it like over there? Man, it's, whew. It's, a, it's a definitely a culture shock from America, but so I think people here at Sierra Leone, one of the first things they may think of is Kanye West. Diamonds are forever. Say diamonds right? are forever. Yeah. Um, I think the second thing that they'll think of is war, right? Um, Sierra Leone has been known to be in a really, really deadly and chaotic civil war. Um, that's been over for over a decade now. A lot of people do not realize that. They're not in a state of war. They're actually in a very peaceful environment. Um, they're stuck in this environment of survival and not survival for safety, survival from uh, economic uh, inputs and outputs. Um, really, there's a lack of knowledge and a lack of experience there. And they need companies to come and really bring, like, like what we did with China, where we brought some warehouses and some infrastructure and provided some jobs um, and gave them an opportunity and give them an opportunity to build up their economy. Now, when you go there, it's, it's very, it's a mixed environment. It's a lot of farmland, but in the main city in Freetown, basically they have, they do have like a downtown area where it's regular buildings, but a lot of the infrastructure, which you get into town, is the old infrastructure from during the, you know, 14, 15, 1600s. And that infrastructure is, is crippled. And then they try to build upon that infrastructure with like metal slabs and things like that to build like these villages so that they can expand to keep up with their population. Now, they're not building real infrastructure, which means they don't have sewage. They don't really have a very good power grid. They have a power grid that's being ran off generators. There's, there's rolling blackouts three to four times a day for their internet and their power. They don't have clean water. Um, even in some of the shacks that they built for a living, they'll have toilet systems, but basically they have to go to the well, get water, hold that well water in their toilet systems dump it into the toilets to flush it through the sewage system that they do, do have, which is like a 1940s sewage system, the way that it operates. And it really is the reason why they have such an issue with clean food, uh, malaria, because of all the mosquitoes, because all of this trash and all of this waste is just kind of built up and they don't have the infrastructure to just wash that through. So it's a very crazy experience, but then you go out to like the beaches, to uh, Toke Beach and these different areas, and there's some of the most beautiful beaches on the world, pure white sand, beautiful clear water, warm water. These beaches are so beautiful. So really, with the right investment and the right time and, and opportunity brought to that area, it really is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Hmm. It's just had very poor governance 
and that's kept them in poverty. But the older generation or the younger generation is now becoming older and they're starting to take over the politics and they're starting to, you know, they've gone out and gotten the Western education and now they're, they're coming back to take over the politics and they have that education. So now they're, they're in an environment where they're ready and pushing for that change to step, step to the next level. And I predict in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be a lot of investment that comes there. And due to that investment, it's going to become one of the top tourist destinations on the planet. Wow. A couple of a few things. You remind me of, uh, have you heard about Akon, uh, what he's done in Africa, the Akon yes. city and all that? Yeah, um, for sure. For sure. With the Akon coin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I guess what's cool, like when I, heard, at least what I know of it or what I heard about it is, you know, mm -hmm. investing into those communities. And it's amazing how, as you described too, like, man, if you just get the right people in place of the government, it can go both ways, right? <laughs> they can drive it straight right. into the ground or they can make it a utopia. Right, right. And that's, that's one of the craziest things about that environment now. You get there and you instantly are like, all right, so you see how the city works. You, you learn real quick. It's a very fast, fast pace. And then you see how the villages are. You kind of feel, get a feel for like the way the communication and transportation system, which is very broken and chaotic, but it still... He works it works efficiently, um, but because of the chaos, that's why no one's really making money off the situation because there's no set funnels to where how that money should be organized and taxed and roads aren't being built and things like that. And so when you're there with that environment, I think that if you're already, if you already have a entrepreneurial sense, you immediately just see problem and solution. Mm. And I think the problem that's happening in these regions and these type of nations are you have people who are coming and they're coming with these singular ideas, but in a system with that much chaos and a system that has that much failure within its governments, you can't think of it in a singular idea. You can only think of it in a set of systematic logistics that works together. And so that's kind of how I viewed Africa now and Sierra Leone and Freetown specifically when I when I'm there is I, I see it as a set of systems that have to be implemented in order for the problems to actually be solved. And that's that's where I think people I want to say are turned off, but they're maybe scared of taking on pr programs there because they're so singularly focused that they're like, okay, I have to do this, but this isn't going to work because these other things aren't in place. And so you have to actually come and be like, all right, so what do I do to build a system where those things are in place simultaneously? And that's how you have to solve the problems there. Do you have any plans to return anytime soon to over there? Um, I will be back in Sierra Leone on March 28th. So in a couple of weeks, I'll be back out there. Oh, and one thing about just Africa in general, I was talking to someone else about this. I never realized how big it is. I think I saw something oh, where you sure. can fit the United States, you for can sure. fit Canada, you can fit Australia, which Australia is like the for size sure. of the U.S. It's insane how because they don't the map doesn't do justice on how really big it really of is. Of course not over there. Of course not. And the crazy thing about it is that that goes back to psychology. Like you don't. This idea that the map is how it looks specifically just because that's the only way the map could be put onto a two-dimensional surface is obviously not true. You can draw, draw it however you want it, so that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to where it's a psychological thing, right? Where they're in a period that they're building what is known as our like most modern version of the map in the globe. This is a time period where America is trying to bolster itself as, you know, the the most powerful influence on the planet. And so a lot of people don't realize is like, that's a lot of this shit is psychological. They create those maps specifically to give this image of this power in the nation, because at the time when they're building those maps, you know, there wasn't TVs, there wasn't movies and social media and these other ways to influence us. So they had a lot simpler ways of trying to paint this picture. And that's why maps like that exist where America looks huge. But when I so when I had when I flew into Africa, I had to fly from um, 
from New York, no, from Atlanta to uh, Belgium to Brussels, and then you fly from Brussels, which is in Europe, and you fly to, to Sierra Leone. And so you have to fly over the Sahara Desert to get to Sierra Leone. And the Sahara Desert itself is the size of the United States. So that Dang. flight is so fucking long. And you're just looking down. I, I, I was there like it was nighttime. It, well, no, it, was, it was, yeah, nighttime into the morning. So I over there at night, and then I got to see it in the morning when the sun was shining. Like going over the Sahara Desert is one of the most fascinating things ever. It's just rolling sands, and like you see these random little like villages that pop up. It's really a crazy experience. But yeah, that flight is ridiculous. And the Sahara Desert's fucking huge for sure. The Sahara Desert's just as long as the United States. That's crazy. Yeah, it's like going from north to south of the United States and east to west. It's like the Sahara Desert is basically the size of the United States. It's <laughs> That's very insane. <laughs> it's crazy, bro. It's really crazy. Man, it just makes you wonder. I'm rolling, you, yeah. I'm rolling up marijuana. So anybody who's watching, if you're offended. <laughs> join, join a new day in, in a toast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what, man? Because, yeah, it's like, you know, they say Africa is the motherland and, you know, how much secrets and knowledge is there. And, you know, I think about stuff like <clears throat> stuff like the Congo <laughs> and the jungles and w- right. what's in there, like the, this uncharted territory for most people that. Um, so it's interesting why you say that. Why would they want to? And here we go with the <laughs> conspiracy talk, but like, why, why do they, why would they want to make it smaller? Why do they want, I bet mean, it makes complete sense with what you say and tying it in what you're saying about social media. I'm sure you and I can talk an hour or more on this, but just the psychological warfare that happens with social media alone. You know, when, we, when I was talking to you several years ago, doing the social media show, I'm like, oh, social media, it's great. Blah, blah, blah. But now I'm like, oh my gosh, I was pushing, I was pushing crack. <laughs> Right, I right. was pushing crack amongst the people and <laughs> social media crack, and it's like right. I look at it now, man, and I, I'm grateful for it because you know you and I are doing what we're doing right now. We stay connected. That's cool. Like that part of it's cool to me. But then, like I've really learned, especially as of late, man, really being careful what I ingest on there into my mental mind frame because it's just right. constant, constant. As my one friend calls it, programming. Like they call it TV pro. It's programming. It's programming your mind. And it is for sure. And it's, and really we can debate going into conspiracy and we can debate that these systems were not just some kid in their basement creating a cool platform that the CIA was already involved. And there's all kinds of theories you can go in. We can debate those things. Um, But I think really, the unknown kind of conspiracies, I don't really try to spend too much time on them. I try to focus more on like the obvious kind of common sense approaches to where the problem and solutions can be. And I think right now the most common sense uh, attainable approach is really just addressing uh, corporations and their marketing platforms because that's really where it comes from. That's where the, really where the control is. That's really where the the reason why our data is so valuable is because it's valuable to these companies. And so these companies are basically able to go in here and get this full access to, to our data. And then you have to also think that most of these companies have some kind of contract, especially when you're talking about like the data collecting companies and social media companies with um, departments like the DOD or the CIA, like these are known. There's, this is the reason why you have Mark Zuckerberg and other of these big tech giants having to have these interviews in front of Congress and having to give these depositions is because they do have government contracts. And so we need to have a full understanding of what those government contracts mean. And because obviously, if we're not very careful of, of regulating that, then these corporations and these tools such as Facebook and Twitter, they really become an arm of the government if it's just as easy as a company to send a lobbyist over, hey, you work some policies in our favor and we'll give you full access to our data. 
and then you have the government who implements these um policies because of COVID-19 or because of the war in Iraq and 9-11, um, which are supposed to be for our security, but which gives them the ability to invade our privacy in a way that they weren't able to before because we're so freely giving it online. And then being able to take that and utilize that um, to really imprison people and put people in jail and in prison um, without a trial for many reasons. We've seen this with hackers in the past. We've seen this um, with Julian Assange and, and different leakers and things like that as it's happened over time. And so it's um, it's something that I think that we're realizing now that technology can't just be this thing that expands around us. It has to be something that we participate in because if we don't participate in it, it's going to become a very, very useful tool to really control everyone in every sense, in every way that they weren't able to before, especially with the implementation of things like the blockchain and Elon Musk Starlink, you know, just think of these things as a collective power to monitor citizens. And it becomes a very scary idea then. So I think that the, the the main thing is we have to participate in the change in the exchange of data. Um, I liked um, Andrew Yang's idea of basically saying, hey, you know, OK, I'll, I'll sign. You give me a breakdown of what the data is. We can do some some kind of contract when I sign up for your website. We're like, I approve what data can be sent to you, but I also there's a uh, I'm compensated for that data, right? Because you're basically taking my data and making money off of it. So we have if we have a program to where the individual is now making the money from the data, then it becomes a fair exchange again, and that's that's democracy more so than anything, I think. Okay, because that was going to so by participating, you mean the user getting a kickback for offering their information as well. Yep, exactly. Every time their data goes and there's a data set that's being sold and their data is part of that data set, that's every time that gets purchased, there's a, an account that's set up through that social media and it goes, you know, whether you use Ethereum or Bitcoin as, as the payment, right? You would use obviously a digital currency since it's a digital process pay it out in the digital currency and then I can transfer that digital currency into fiat currency and be able to utilize it economically. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I, th I don't, can't remember if it was a, in a documentary I saw, but basically it was when you check that box, like I consent the Google boxes, you know, that hardly probably no one ever reads <laughs> like what <laughs> yeah. you're actually consenting to, but most people have no idea, you know, it's yeah, for sure. And so that's, that's, you're going to move around with me. I'm going to go outside so I can smoke. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. No, that's, and that's what's important is, is that first set of boxes where you, you know, check, I acknowledge, it should automatically pull a drop down and that drop down should discuss our data. And that mm -hmm. data should basically give us different, we could basically say, no, you cannot collect my data in any way, platform at all. And that should be pretty solid that, hey, you can't collect my data. I shouldn't have to argue about my own data, right? Yeah. Um, you can go that way or, yeah, you can collect data. And if I choose to collect data, then there should be another drop down that basically shows which data you can be collecting, what I approve of. And then once you go from there, then it will basically be, you know, you get paid point zero 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 one bitcoin or whatever the hell it is per you know interaction or whatever whatever it may be right yeah yeah shoot i never really even thought of it like that that's a, and andrew yang he came up with that concept yeah well i mean he didn't really come up with it it was just something he subscribed to it was a concept that was around for a while he was promoting. and you know yeah. he just you know was like hey you know this is something that we should utilize even more so i mean and he was his main thing was basically ubi universal basic income which mm -hmm. the reality with ubi is that's going to happen eventually and i and whether it's in 
10 years, whether it's in 50 years, I think we shouldn't be so hung up on the amount of time it takes to get to something that is inevitable. Mm-hmm. If it's in a, if it's, if we know it's inevitable, it's actually economically smarter for us to like, okay, we know this is inevitable. Let's get there the quickest way we can. Mm-hmm. And so with the expansion of technology and artificial intelligence, they're going to slowly chip away at infrastructure and they're going to, we're going to lose jobs. Many, many jobs are going to become unnecessary over a period of time. Um, it's debatable what that period of time is for each mm-hmm. industry, right? Right now in Vegas, you can go to bars and be served by a robot. In China, there's hundreds of bars where you can be served by robots, your food and everything. This is a thing that's happening. And then you have Elon, who is now went from not just his cars, He's now producing more robots than he's producing vehicles. Hmm. And so these are things that are absolutely going to happen regardless of anything. So the best, the best thing for us to do is to operate in a way that is already prepared for that transition as opposed to trying to fight it and slow it down and hold on to this old infrastructure that we have, right? Yeah, I'm curious to get your opinion because I've heard, I, I've listened to Andrew Yang a few times. He makes a lot of good points. Um, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with Naval Ravikant. He's, uh, he's talked about a little bit about too, but basically we'll get to this point where people basically, we're, we're, we're like creatives at the end of the day. Human beings are creative and eventually like by getting rid of the jobs and having the universal basic income, people will be able to just create all day. So my quote, my question to you for people like you and I, that's like the lotto. Like for me, that's like, hell yeah. Like let's just make shit all day. Like Elon, make it all day long. If you're a music artist, a painter, whatever you are, do it. But like Mm -hmm. an argument against it, I've heard, which is interesting is not all people may be like that and they need jobs for their own self-worth and for something to do. Um, what, what, I'm just curious to get your take on that. What do you think it's going to do to human beings and our civilization if we head that route? Or do you think we'll just adapt to it and it'll just be the way it is? We're already adapting to it. That's what the blockchain is. That's what NFTs are. That's what, they, that's what NFTs are. NFT is our generation, the generation of kids right now is growing up with NFTs now. And so guess what? they're doing everything digitally anyway. So everything's creative digitally anyways, creating avatars. Every single kid has an avatar, whether it's on their gaming system, on their social media, that's creative. They're expressing themselves creatively by utilizing these tools. Mm. We're already in that process. Mm. And so one technology is a very strange thing because we we experience this with every industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. The technology gets developed all these people come out and they make all these conspiracy theories about this technology. Technology still gets developed and it takes over and it ends up changing the economy. Like that's going to happen. So it's happening now and you can't take, you can't look at 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds and really be concerned and think about your business plan based off their opinion. Cause it's completely fucking irrelevant. Mm-hmm. They can, maybe affect government policy a little bit because it's mostly a bunch of old guys hanging up up there. And so they may slow down the process through policies and the government, but ultimately it doesn't fucking matter. The young guys are eventually going to get those positions that understand these technologies, understand the processes of it. And because of that, this idea that we need to have these original uh, World War II second industrial revolution jobs is not it's not relevant in the way that these kids are growing up. Mm-hmm. But is that good or bad? That's where your argument can come in because these kids are growing up on social media and social media is a very, very fabricated environment that definitely does not always align with the actual physical and emotional experiences of the real world. Mm. 
Yeah, it's a balance because you want you want you would want kids to know how to use the technology, but at the same time, you really don't want the technology to raise the kids and have them have no interpersonal exactly. communication skills. That's where the fine line lies. And part of my ignorance, but I think you're the perfect person to ask this and the most knowledgeable one that's been on the podcast so far on this subject. NFTs and Bitcoin. I understand Bitcoin and all that, but the NFTs, I'm still not quite clear <laughs> exactly what they are. Like, exactly, can you, for someone like me that really hasn't paid too much attention to them, obviously I've been hearing it like crazy. What, what exactly are these NFTs and why are they so valuable? Got you. All right. So you're talking about what is the metaverse? So the metaverse is for just simplified understanding a digital version of our world virtual so, reality that's right and so a complete but completely immersive right so now you're looking at a world where we are going or our younger generation because of the old, old some of the older generation we're never going to adapt into it um but a lot of the younger generation and all businesses every business that exists will have to operate in this world will have a avatar uh, that they will interact with this world in, right? Uh, this world is just basically the digital version of the world. So it's creatures that move around, that can pick up objects, that walk, that talk. There's buildings. It's just like our world, right? So then what happens is, all right, we know this world's going to be, there's going to exist on many different platforms. And so the next question is, how much amount of time will the average person be spending in this world, right? Um, so let's say that that amount of time is equivalent to the amount of time that, or a fraction, so let's say it's 50% of the amount of time that people spend on social media. Say somebody spends 12 hours a day on social media. If you're in the metaverse, 50% of that time, you're at six hours in the metaverse. Let's say it's only 25% of the time, you're three hours in the metaverse, right? Well, when you're in the metaverse, you're experiencing things with with your senses just like the world just in a different way just like the regular world so that means that things such as marketing are going to have the same effect if not more of an impactful effect because say i walk around and i see a poster in the real world i have to remember the name of the poster or take a picture of the poster or write down the number of the poster or the website of the poster right to try to figure out like, okay where do i find this product or buy this ticket whatever it is right in the metaverse i can be walking see the poster and the poster could have its own digital utilities where it actually interacts with the environment so I'll say i'm my metaverse character and i touch the poster that poster i've touched it and now brings me directly out of the world what I, where I'm experiencing the metaverse into this other fucking metaverse world of the options for all the tickets and everything. And it's a 3D environment ticket experience, right? So now it's this, this digital asset that has an actual utility attached to it. So what they're doing is taking physical material items and putting them into the metaverse digital world and adding a utility to it and so say something like a painting right so i have a piece of artwork i make an nft which is just like a, a digital art digital artwork right i buy the digital artwork from the person which sets its value and then i take that digital artwork and say i have a home inside of the metaverse i hang that on my home in the metaverse and that does artwork now when you walk in my home is it's a digital asset it does whatever it, whatever it does in the artwork right that artwork might have utility expanded into it so that artwork itself might do something so the artwork say i built the artwork and if you touch it it's a game so now when you come into my metaverse house you go to my piece of artwork and you touch it and it takes you into a whole fucking game that could be the utility of it so they're just taking that and they're putting a value on it into into the digital world that's and that's really what it is like you can do that with photos videos you can do it with sound um i think 
over time they're going to be doing it with you know i might mean i may have a metaverse and i might have a bookshelf like you have a bookshelf behind you but it's in my metaverse and each one of those books may be um they may be nfts themselves so you can go to those books and access it and access the utility and then maybe you can buy that book from me you know maybe i wrote all those books back there and now you can purchase them online because they're connected to the blockchain that's what that's really what the nfts are they're taking a creative piece and connecting it to the blockchain and then we're giving it value by trading and and purchasing these items within the blockchain and so they'll operate just like artworks or physical works in our environment but they have added utilities that we can add to them which makes them possibly more valuable than some of our physical works that's crazy <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean that in a bad way it's just like you know it's like mind-blowing so it's I get and because some of the, I've heard some people like making a ton of money off of it too, like selling these things. And is, is it one of those things where it's like a one of a kind thing, or like you said, like yes. books you can sell multiple of them, like or is it only like you can only sell at one time? Or I'm, I guess that's where I'm not sure. So it's both. It's weird. It's both. So like, for example, so every single one is its own individual NFT. For example. Tory Lanez released a song that was an NFT. And he released it. I think he released only like 1.5 or 2 million NFTs of it. So each version of it was an individual NFT that had to be coded into the blockchain and they were sold. And I think he made... And I think I think I don't think it was a million of them. I think it was far less than them. I think it was like maybe like a few thousand or whatever. But he made a million dollars in fifteen seconds. Yeah. And it's because he had so few, whatever it was like a couple thousand, whatever it was, he had so few of that song, and you could only purchase it on NFT, the value of it right. was bigger than releasing a song on Spotify. It's genius. This is what this is why people think that Kanye's out of his mind don't understand that Kanye West is a genius. Right. By him not releasing his second uh, Donda 2 on any of the platforms and only on his physical digital player is brilliant. What people don't understand is he's opened up a market for his digital player now to be literally just like, if number one, it's nostalgic. So like it's fun to have something physical to play with. Mm -hmm. You know, we actually do enjoy that because we haven't really had anything like that for a long time. So it actually does sell because like it's mm -hmm. cool to have. And then the fact that it has all the stems of every song so I can kind of maneuver the sound how I want. And then the fact that it doesn't just play Donna 2, whatever other digital asset I download into it, it can play. So guess what? Now it becomes this physical real life NFT player. Bro knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. He doesn't need he doesn't need to release it on Spotify anymore. It's they're they're breaking those they're breaking away from those chains now. He's taking control of his own his own music. Did you see have you seen the uh the Kanye docu series on Netflix? I have Genius, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant, bro. Wow. Brilliant. I, uh, my girlfriend and I watched it, dude. Like, and I, I was just geeking out the entire time because For sure. I just kept looking at him. Just like, that's, that's, I remember this. Like, I remember when this album, I, I didn't, I never, what I didn't understand, like, there's a lot we could talk about with this, but I think one of the biggest takeaways for me with this from it was if there's ever an example of someone who believes in themselves, <laughs> It's him. And I didn't sure. realize, I, I remember hearing about, I remember he put up the money for Through the Wire. I remember hearing that, but really seeing what he was working against. And he was, he was quote unquote in the industry. And he was, this is before the internet. He just couldn't throw it out there. He had to go through those hoops right. to get this project made. And he's making beats for people. He doesn't even, he's just doing it to fuel his music. And he believed in it that much. And it took years for him to do but then when like it just all came together and he made it happen and then just seeing his evolution of going into all the stuff he's into now fashion and uh the technology and whatever he's doing it's, it's really remarkable man i think it's it's one of the best documentaries i've ever seen ever 
Like it's it really it's well, it's because it's so real and so raw. Like the fact that those dudes had the insight to say we have to film this is because this is going to be one of the most important documentaries in hip hop ever. Like the, for them to have that intuition, that insight, and to be there for those moments, and to remain there for those moments, even in Kanye's process of becoming full of himself when he went through that that uh, God phase when he felt when he had that God complex, and you know you show you see him in the documentary calling dude by the wrong name and different things where it's just like, damn, even in the parts where you could tell it was hard to be there because Kanye was going through his change. For them to have the insight to sit, stick through that and keep going is what makes that brilliant. Very great point. Because, yeah, I, I think it's worthy of the Oscar. Like, I, when I watch it, it should win an Oscar. And, like, for Cootie to leave whatever he was doing just to go, okay, I sent something. He, like, gave up the comedy. Of it. I'm just going to go start filming this guy. Because the footage, man, it's like, especially if you're a hip-hop Kanye fan, it's just like, dude, this is beyond gold. Like, this is footage i never even knew existed on some of this stuff and it just really imagine the patience it took imagine the patience it took 20 for. years <laughs> the patience and the work that took he had to sit there and watch kanye go through all these phases and sit in the background and watch this man in order for his ultimate dream ultimate goal to come to flourishing that's that's very 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 incredible and brilliant in its own sense and i did I, I watched it and just hearing his story on top of what mm. his process was of collecting it and his experience of collecting it and then having to decide when the right time to drop it is having to decide okay this is done this is it's time now having to make that especially look, look at everything that's happening right now this is all content that could be part of the documentary though and he had to decide okay this is where we 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 draw the line. This is where the story is told. We allow we'll we'll drop this and we'll allow him to tell the rest of the story. Or is there more? You know, are they? Or is he still recording? Is there going to be a part two? You know, what I mean, we don't know. Yeah, you bring up a great point, man. It is true. It's, sometimes it's the timing of things. It's not exactly what you're doing. It's going to be the timing of it. And you're right. He could have released this half the time ago when Kanye was really really giant then. Right, you know, but he to have that patience, like you just said, to be like, no, nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see where this goes, and sure enough, <laughs> all the other Kanye stuff that's happened, he got like he pretty much got pretty much caught up <laughs> toward the end of the documentary. Not to give it away, but it's incredible. But no, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad um, you appreciate that documentary because I just I don't know just because some people I think with Kanye. I don't know how many people like, you know, cause I know people like you and I, I mean, we were there fallen since uh, college dropout, right. you know, but people that maybe caught him on to him late with all the craziness or whatever it is. They go, oh, who's this guy? So I think it really, really just paints that picture. Oh, and here, here's one of the most powerful things in the whole thing I saw. And I knew how close he was with his mom or at least had heard, but man, you really got to see how big of a force she was in his life. Right. Like, she was probably the one person that kept, could truly keep him in check. And she was there. She was right there. Like she was right at the there. show. She was on tour. She's she was she really was there. She really was involved. And she really did tell him, like, you can absolutely do anything. Like you're not gonna be stopped. Like and it showed that like that shit worked. It might have been it might have been extreme, but it worked. <laughs> Yeah, and they were doing charity stuff together. They had foundations. And, and then the one quote she says, uh, I think he put it in there twice. She's just like, remember, Kanye, a giant looks in the mirror and he sees nothing. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And you could just right. tell like he was humble with it, it. was very interesting watching him with her as opposed to everyone else in that documentary. Like there, there was a shift in him when he was in her presence. And it was just, it was beautiful to see. And then you also... You feel empathy for him. You feel, man, like he, yeah. uh, him losing her definitely did not help him. Like in terms of probably his right, mental yeah. mind state. Yeah, that wasn't, he wasn't acting on that. That was, no. that, that was a real bond that has affected him ever since. And you could see it in, in the way his entire world changed after her death, you know? Yeah. He, he definitely coped 
or attempted to cope with it very, very publicly, you know? Mm. Let me ask you this. What's your take on the whole music scene now these days? That's trash. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's, um, we're in a transition, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I think that I wish there was something that was going to come in and stand as a balance to where too much of the music scene becomes fully digital and so there's still a kind of talent raw talent acts aspects to it um and i think that's we're losing that we're losing that space and because of that it's just becoming it's becoming easier to make and it's it's just like i think music is affected by the same thing that everything else is affected by and it's that this this rule that says <clears throat> hard times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men and weak men create hard times and i think that happens in music and so over time music and technology have clashed and we've been trying to get our musical expression out faster so that we can make more money off of it faster and cheaper. Um, that's led into this digital world. Um, by necessity, technology always makes things simpler. So by necessity, those digital assets made making the music easier, which means you had to be less talented which means that there's also a psychological thing happened there, right? So even the writing, um, it's less uh, intellectual and things like that. And so it is, it's by nature, it's dumber. The music's just in general dumber. Um, you just, you, you, you take, take the Renaissance till now, it's a little dumbing down of music gradually, right? And you, you can literally map that. And so I think, we're just in this transition of that, and I'm actually really terrified to see what happens to music once we happen once we get into the metaverse. Um, but we'll see. I just the environment looks like it's going to get more fraudulent. It's going to get more. I don't know. I don't know what the right word for it is, but it's not heading in the right direction. I think that musicians, we need to um, control it in a way as artists to where we have more control of that process so it doesn't get oversaturated. Because that's really what I'm concerned about. It gets too easy and it becomes oversaturated. TikTok is already showing that to be a thing. There's so many just random artists that are coming from TikTok now that's just like, all right, you made a, a cool song with some filters that you're able to use on an app you know what i mean i don't think that should generate a record deal or generate you know a, a hot single or things like that unless you're a really dope artist that can maintain that shit consistently and can show your writing ability or your playing ability of an instrument or your production ability or even if you're in, you're an engineer um some kind of physical talent you know that's what i think so i just think it's like it's a complicated environment right now. There's a lot of dope artists. There's a lot of talented artists. Um, you know, you still have, you know, like your aunt, your, your like uh, Anderson Pack, who's a brilliant producer, brilliant drummer. Um, you know, you have these artists that are still super dope that are really still doing high numbers. You still have Kanye, who's still number one. He's an extremely talented producer and his team producers are amazing and he has a great team of writers. Um, their creativity and their focus on physical product, I think is saving the industry. I think that it's an absolute necessity to the industry. Um, so I think overall talent still reigns supreme in the industry, but I think there's just a lot of room for bullshit. And I, I wish that would get tightened up so that it, there'd be a lot more uniqueness in the game. I think that's what we're, we're missing is uniqueness. And I love what you just said and tying back into the <coughs> thing a little bit mixed with like what I really loved and same, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, fade to black, the Jay Z documentary from years ago, back when yeah, the black album, for sure. that's one of my favorite. That's what the, the this reminded me of, man. I love just that 
they're in the studio environments. You go to the studio, they're writing. Like you, it was a freaking process, man. And I agree. Like, yeah. look, it's a two way street. Cause like same with the film business. It's like, Back then, it was really hard to make a movie. Like, you needed hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars just to make a movie. Now, right. you have one of these. <laughs> right. iPhone, you could make You movies. can literally make a movie. Literally make a movie, which is, and even the, I got the newer one now, and it's just like, oh my God, like, this camera's insane. But it's like, which that's cool. I support that. And same with the music, but at the same time, I agree with you too. It's like, it does kind of oversaturate, and it does dampen kind of the whole thing a little bit and it's yeah. not to say that there's not going to be great shit still made because there will be but there's also going to be a lot of other shit <laughs> that just kind of is all over the place and i don't know it kind of i don't know that just that early 2000s area late 90s early 2000s man like just watching like you know kanye going in the studio of pharrell and Lud showed Luder he jumped in on one of Ludacris's studio sessions Ludacris is literally riding out in the car like to yeah, come, I'm it's like, crazy. Man, that, it's I, crazy to see that stuff. Isn't that dope? I'm just like, that's. It really just shows you, like, this is what they do. Like, they do this, and there's no special filters or apps or no. It's just their talent and some some high end recording gear. <laughs> like, right. The doc, I think this documentary really humanized the experience for a lot of people. Because I think a lot of people have like these overly like magical ideas of what happens in the in those environments in their mind and i'm like nah bro them fools be sitting in the car or sitting in the bathroom on the toilet riding i'm like yeah. it's not like they're working not what you think it is you you have the conspiracy theorists who think they're like down in a dungeon and writing the song with the devil <laughs> and then <laughs> you have other people who think they're just like in a fucking cocaine frenzy and naked bitches everywhere and it's like nah bro like this is when it comes to writing and producing music like there's what they show you for music videos and there's what they show you on reality TV, but in real life, it's not, it's not like that most of the time. You know, I mean, you have some too. artists who, you have some artists who do function that way. They mm -hmm. write better when they have a group of people hyping them up. I noticed that a lot with these younger, newer, newer rappers who are writing content that's more like shock and awe, right? Oh, he said that, that was real funny or that was crazy or ooh, you know, those kind of rappers, it seems like they usually have like a bunch of people and they're all just getting real turned up. But you have, you have an artist like Drake. Nah, he's in there. He's, you know, he's in there. Here, they're writing, really going in and really tapping into his deepest emotions and, and putting out the best product he possibly can. You know, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a difference in the way that art is conducted. Yeah, and I guess none of it's really, it, it's just, it's not good or bad. Some people, different strokes for different folks, I guess. Yeah. yeah, it's not a good or bad thing. It's yeah. just that people draw their motivation and their inspiration from different things. Okay. And uh, yeah, we got we got a little more time still. I'm good, bro. Okay. Uh, it's debating was just it was gonna. So is the world coming to an end? No. <laughs> is the world coming? In? That's a that's a that's a that's a valid question, bro. You really you'd be one valid. guy. You and you and a couple others in my in, in my circle would be so. You'd definitely be someone I would ask that. <laughs> where let me ask I have you about a very... it, where, where is the world going? Where is the world going? I know we've talked technology and stuff, but what 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 do you think the whether it's the powers that be, whether it's the corporations, where, where do you think this is all headed? I think that if you were to be honest with yourself and take a look at the world from a non-biased viewpoint, you would have to accept the fact that <clears throat> late 90s, early 2000s conspiracy theorists were correct. Really bottom line. The idea was there were technologies that were being created that is going to create an environment in the world where, and pardon me if I sound really biblical right now, but this is just our reality, where they will control the ability to buy, sell, and trade through a singular point. It's really that simple. They want to be able to have pure access to the data in a digital way that they can access through a convenient way that is always attached to the body. That's, that's what the conspiracies revolved around. And that's what literally they're telling us in the news is happening. 
now these days. That's, you know, the digital ID that the UN keeps talking about that will have our passport records, our IDs, all those things into it. <clears throat> Just a very overinflated version of what China is already doing, just you know, just like a credit system. Which I mean, we already are, we already operate in a credit system, but this is a credit system to really an extreme. And so that's, this, I don't even think it's a question of we're going there. Like we're going there. That's what happened. It's you know, they used COVID. Whatever you believe about COVID, whether it was released intentionally, it was actually an accident. It came from bat soup or it came, you know, where I, I believe it came from. It came from the lab. Um, <clears throat> none of that matters. All that matters is how did our governments conduct themselves during that process? And that tells you all you need to know. You can, they focused our argument on where it came from. And the reason why they focused our argument on where it came from is because they didn't want us to sit there and pay attention and be like, well, look what these dumb motherfuckers are doing right here. And if you really pay attention to what happened, it was either stupidity or incompetence. And I absolutely do not believe these people are incompetent. Um, I think that it is convenient to portray themselves as being incompetent because it softens up how we view what's happening in their decision making and i think just in reality with their decision making is clearly they're taking advantage of what's going on whether it was intentional or not it happened covid did happen and they're taking advantage of it to move forward with the things that you know benefit them in the long run kind of and like I think that's what we're <clears throat> exactly it's it's a exactly what it is it didn't matter if it was done intentionally or not all that matters is what was done with the opportunity that it presented. And that's that's where we come in as people is where, okay, something happens. We as a people need to decide, okay, this is the direction that we're going to go and not look at the government and wait for them to decide for us. And that's what keeps happening. These things happen. We look at the government. We make, They make a decision. We argue over the decision. The government does whatever it wants anyways because people – just psychologically, war is viewed differently than it was generations ago, right? So we're all trying to figure out how to fight a war without having to physically fight a war at all times. That's just kind of the kind of constant state of fight or flight mentality that we're in, having to balance our lives in the physical and the digital realities. And so <clears throat> I think that I don't, I don't know if I foresee a civil war popping off in our country, but we are definitely weaker than we've been in a long time. And that weakness is being exploited and it's growing. And that's intentional because if you want a global governance, you have to beat whoever is the most powerful nation on the world. And Beating that doesn't necessarily mean going to war with it. It means more so being able to get inside of it and being able to weaken it. And I think that's what's happening right now. I think America is too bolsterous and too prideful. I think Trump was kind of the last stand for that. Like, no, we're America. We're the most powerful. I think he was the last stand for that. And I think the idea is to weaken America and get us in line so that we're just integrated into this government as opposed as a leading power in it like we have been for the last you know century and so you can definitely see we're going to go down in the power curve they'll you will know it and this is really the big thing this is what the big the big change was this is what happened the dutch to the british the british to us and then now us to more likely China is there'll be a change in who holds the reserve currency. And that's where China is going right now. They're making all these deals and doing all these movements and changes and really getting on board with cryptocurrency because they want to be the reserve currency. Because the minute that they become the reserve currency, 
all the contracts and deals and power structure starts to move towards them. Then the nation who's in power, which will be us, we're not going to just like allow the power to go away. So we're going to become a lot more combative. And that's probably going to, that's, we're seeing that right now. We're in that process. We're being a lot more combative towards China as they're starting to grow and expand and gain their power. And I don't think China will ever foresee that power. I think that we will see war. I don't know when that war is going to happen, but we are going to see a pretty extreme war happen probably at least within the next decade. And I don't think the outcome of that war is the normal process of a single nation taking over a currency. I think the outcome of that war will be what really launches the global alliance and the global governance. I think that's that's how this is going to play out. Because I just, we can't, we can't, we can't survive another third war to go completely into world war. So in order for human beings to survive, we have to avoid nuclear confrontation. And that's the only thing that I see avoiding that is somehow, some way, some global structures created. Now, is that a good or bad thing? Again, that's debatable because the question is, None of these people are doing a good job at running cities, states, countries, nations, blah, 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 right? Who or what group of people has the foresight, insight, compassion, empathy, um, global understanding to be able to successfully and efficiently run a global government? I don't think that group of people actually exists. And so the people who would be running this global government will not be efficient. And so where does that lead? That's, I think that's my biggest concern is where does that lead? Man, that was well said. A um, couple of some, some things I'll <clears throat> add on. <clears throat> piggyback off of what you know i don't care what you believe one side or the other with the whole pandemic whatever you want to believe you believe right and but one thing that we did see more than anything and you said it we got to see how governments even at the local level operate in times of panic and most of them crumbled like a cookie and it's like it's like you i never realized how important <clears throat> excuse me like even at the local level, your city government, like those people that you vote in for your city council and the mayor and all that, when things go down, those are important roles, <laughs> especially. And now seeing like, wow, these people really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like a lot of them, they really don't, yeah. they're not leaders. They're, there's, there's zero yeah. leadership amongst many of them. Right. You know? And it really exposed that from the local to the national level. Just for sure. You don't care about us. <laughs> like, yeah, you know? not at all. The interesting thing about that is that it wouldn't matter if it was all orchestrated for it wasn't all orchestrated just to speak directly to conspiracy theorists and non-conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't matter if it was a plan. The outcome was the same because if it was orchestrated. Then that they mean they needed to be efficient and at least acting out these parts to convince us, right? Mm -hmm. And they weren't even able to do that. So if they were trying to play these roles to convince us, they really failed miserably at that anyway. So their ability to be efficient and effective, no matter if it's conspiracy or not, was a failure. So it, didn't, it doesn't really matter about the conspiracy part of it or not because they're failing at what they're trying to attempt to do anyways. And that should be enough to spark the community to be like, all right, so these guys, whatever it is they're fucking doing, they're failing at it. They're not staying consistent. Um, they obviously don't know the science enough to be consulting us on what it actually means to trust the science, right? Because they, they keep changing the science um weekly monthly and then when it when it all comes down to it i just look back at the, to the beginning of the pandemic to like a, a few sh 
simple facts. Number one, it's a proven fact that it started spreading in at least, uh, what was it, um, September or October from the previous year, mm -hmm. and, and who was aware of it. Mm -hmm. So number one, they knew this virus was spreading months before they said anything to America or the West. Why? Um, this means that WHO, which is supposed to be an international organization, sided with China. They had the information from China when they're like, okay, we're going to allow China to dictate how this operates. One of the very first things that stood out to me that not enough people question to me, that's common sense, is they closed their, in, their, their internal borders in China once the virus was known. They closed their inter internal borders. So you cannot fly city to city, but they kept international flights open under under the council of who and the UN. So they were aware, who was aware that this virus is spreading and was, did, they did not tell them, hey, close your international borders so this doesn't become a pandemic. They said, no, let's keep international flights open so we don't have an effect on the economy. They're, to me, they're telling us to their face, like, yeah, we let the virus spread. Because when, you, when you're talking about it, a pandemic, you're talking about a virus that you're telling me that is deadly, you don't let flights go because you're going to protect the economy. That's fucking ridiculous. That's absolutely insane. That makes no sense at all. No logical person is like, yeah, definitely let the killer pandemic spread so that you can protect the economy. No, that's not a thing. Like, let's, you mean it's only in one country and it's nowhere else? Stop that shit. We'll figure out our own economies and cut China off for now. Period. They, they like cut them off. We'll give them the assistance that they need so they can take, get that under control. We'll figure out our economies. We can get shipments and ship from other places. You know, we can we can stop the the transport of specific technologies right now. Like our infrastructure is good enough. We're okay. We're able to stop the economy for the beginning of the virus. We can, you know, we can we you know. What I mean? So it just it didn't it didn't make sense from the beginning. The fact that they kept those international flights open tells me that like they knew the virus was going to spread. There's there's no possible way it doesn't spread. There, people are in the country, the virus is spreading, now they're flying to other countries. There's only one result in that. The minute that that, that became public, I didn't believe a word they said after that because that's, such a, that's so disgustingly evil to me, no matter what the reason behind it is. If they're looking at this virus, they're like, people are gonna die, let it spread. They knew it was going to spread if they kept those international flights open. And from there, that's when I just was like, all right, this is going to be a shit show. And it was a fucking shit show. The whole thing was a shit show. So like, I don't, I don't think any of us know it all, but what I'm lied to, I don't look at the liar for the solution at that point. And so that's the reason why, like, that's my issue with like vaccinations. You guys told all this lies, and now you're forcing a vaccine more than anything that you've ever forced in the world. And I think that, like, I should not know. No, we should not know if each other are vaccinated or not. No one else knows about any. Do you know anybody else's other vaccines? Have you ever cared about what their vaccines were? It's a personal I choice. I, I do not care what vaccine you have. I don't care. I absolutely do not care. And especially after this situation, had had bodies start dropping in the streets like those footage, that fake ass footage they they put out in the beginning. Remember the beginning of the pandemic? They put. Uh, that yeah, I remember out. hearing about it. Yeah, and it was like supposedly just bodies just dropping in the streets. Had that happened, then I would have been. I would have been like, you know, yeah, let's be a fucking a vaccine that's helping us. Like, yeah, okay, it's there's bodies dropping in the street. Let's get this shit and push this shit along, even if there are side effects. Some it, it's a balance. It's 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 about figuring out what's best for 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 yourself or for the circumstances, right? Say that bodies are dropping around you, and a few people are catching a few side effects. I think that if you see bodies dropping around you, you're probably gonna get the vaccine. I just think naturally that's just what's gonna happen. But if you go outside and, and the world looks pretty much like it did before, and you're healthy and you're like, yeah, but it's not really a vaccine and you're or, or, or a pandemic that you're trying to push on me and now you're trying to say that 
I absolutely have to get this vaccine and I'm, I've gotten sick already. I was fine. I have my, my body's built up its own immunities. Why do I need this vaccine when now the numbers are showing that the virus is being passed around by vaccinated people? It just did, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense anymore. This, this whole thing is just, it's gone too far. And what it tells me is that they're, they're taking it and they're extending it intentionally. They're doing it intentionally. And so yeah, you just have to think, why? What is the purpose? Other than, you know, there's, they're making money off of it, obviously. The vaccine makes, I'm sure it's making trillions of fucking dollars. There's a financial side of it. There's a power side of it. But I think there's always a bigger picture, though. There's always a bigger picture, something that's more hidden from us that ultimately happens. Yeah. And something I'll add on to all that is just what's been amazing to watch for me is just how easily it is to divide, like how easy it is and dying in our whole conversation. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what end of the spectrum you believe what the, they don't care either. The point is, as long as we have some over here that think this and some over here that think that, Perfect, because yeah. <laughs> we're just going to keep them arguing over these points that we just blast in the media over and over again. But like you said earlier, but what's really going on in the background of all of it? You know, regardless of where you think it came from or it didn't come from or whatever, that's not the point. The point is you're going to be arguing about this person over here and you guys are going to totally lose who you are and get deep into rage and not think about anything else, but this is my enemy. Right. But it's like, and that, that's one thing that I think probably taught me the most during this time is like, and that's what's really caused me to really take a step back off of social media is besides just from the networking aspects. Like, you know what, this is all programming and they're trying to get, and I've fallen in it, man. I'll admit I've fallen into the political traps, the whatever, and I catch myself and I look back. What was I doing? I didn't, it's, and it's something new every day. It's something new and it's something different. And as soon as one thing phases out, they bring you the next thing to yeah, go against people sure. with, you know? So that's why I guess what I'm trying to say is too, is that's why when I hear about what you're doing, man, in Africa and like, uh, that's real shit, man. Like, so good for you for like transcending out of this. I'm like, all right, how can I actually help the world? <laughs> Cause we need yeah, more man, of I that. Think, yeah, man, I think that, I'm here, bro. Like, what else am I? What, what are we really doing? You know, this this get super rich and then party at all the nightclubs across this world. I mean, what are we doing here? Like, I, I think that the biggest problem that humanity has right now is that we haven't taken the time to just really just get on a get on the same page and have this like singular idea like all right we're we're humanity what the fuck are we doing right yeah. you know you have nations that have their all their own goals and everything but it's like we're here we're all here we all have to be here we're all divided on um, what should be getting done well let's let's figure it out let's sit back and be like all right well what what are our real issues that we have to face mm. and what are some of the major solutions to those issues and how do we get there quicker and until we get to a point where we as a society have goals as a society, we're going to be dealing with this unnecessary conflict that we're dealing with continuously in repetitive cycles. And, and uh, bringing, and I and honestly, I, I'll be, I, I don't know too much about this situation. I'm sure you probably know more than me, but the whole Ukraine thing when it happened or started to happen, <sighs> like when that first popped off, my first thought was just like, <laughs> we are not evolved like we think we are. Like we think we're like this really advanced species and this, I'm like, you know, it's like- We're, we're ridiculous. We're just like the cavemen, except now we have missiles and bombs except in, instead of like sticks and rocks. <laughs> it's right, the same, I'm like, really? Like, th are we still doing this? Like, is this still like happening? Like, I don't, I'm not that impressed. Like, yeah, there's some cool shit from humanity, but then like some stuff I see, I'm just like, we are so uh, not as sophisticated and evolved as we think we are. At least some of us. 
I'm not saying I am or you are or anything, but it's like as a whole, we should be doing, like you just said, we should be doing things to figure out world shit. And if aliens were to come by here or if they are watching, they're probably going like, you know, we're really not going to waste our time with these guys (laughs) because A, they're just crazy and B, they're just going to kill themselves off. So we'll just wait it out, you know? So it's. Right. I, I, man, look. I, I don't even know where to begin. Like, so this Ukraine thing is very interesting because the West is just as much to blame for it as Russia. This isn't just an all Russia thing. There's Vladimir Putin is a communist. He's a dictator, more specifically. Um, we know that he believes that the downfall of the Soviet Union is one of the greatest tragedies in humanity. So he's a Soviet at heart. Now, for years, he has talked to the United Nations and offered deals and treaties that would include Russia in the United Nations, basically, so they could work together um, as a true European Union that includes Russia. For whatever reason, the UN was not having it. NATO, NATO specifically, wasn't having it. They they were not willing to open arms to Russia. Now, if you're a new leader in a growing society that has to worry about the safety of your people, the economy and things like that. And you have this group of European nations who were created to destroy your country at your border. And they keep encroaching on your border over time. They're getting, they're, they're recruiting more nations and they're getting closer and closer to your border all the way to the point where there's only one nation left and that's your Ukraine. And you've told them over and over again, and they've, Obama promised you, we are not going to expand NATO. NATO expanded. Even though Obama pro- pro- promised you that would not happen, NATO expanded. And now we've gotten to the point where Biden's in, and there's only one country now between you, and you have told NATO over and over again, do not expand to my country. I will, I will defend myself if you expand NATO to my country. NATO was created to destroy this nation. We are no longer the Soviet Union. We are Russia now. So there's no reason for NATO to see us as a threat or to expand their weapon systems towards our borders. Now, they've continued to expand those systems towards the borders. Trump calmed it down. Basically was like, hey, we're not worried about Ukraine. We're not going to sign these deals with Ukraine. We're not, no, Ukraine's not going to be part of NATO. Putin's like, all right, cool. He's chilling, right? Then Biden comes in and the Ukraine and NATO talk kicks back up. This, this is what happens. Why poke the bear? For what is the what is the reason to even open up the negotiation for Ukraine being in NATO when strategically we all know what it looks like from the outside looking in as much as we can without you know actual data from the government, but from how it looks from our standpoint, having Ukraine as a buffer nation makes sense for the situation that Europe is in with Russia and NATO. And integrating Russia in some way into that collaboration makes sense too, as they're a European nation. So there's obviously something more there that we're not understanding because none of this shit makes any sense. Trying to expand NATO doesn't make any sense. Putin is obviously more cornered than we realize he is for him to take these actions. There's more going on there than we know for him to take these actions. Because he knows he can't just go head-to-head war with NATO and the United States. He knows he can't do that. 
Look how much he's struggling with Ukraine. Granted, he's only got 8% of his forces in Ukraine, you know, so still like 90 plus percent of his forces are still in Russia. So granted, it's a small amount of forces there, but he doesn't want to, I, I don't believe he wants to go to war with NATO and US because he can't, he can't win that war by, by himself. So the only way that war could even be a possible thing that could happen is if North Korea, Iran, and China are all in on this, and they're all simultaneously going to strike, and then the shit hits the fan. Like, that's the only way Russia would really do. Russia can't just go against us all by himself, by itself. There's more to this. There's something more happening there. There's definitely something more happening in this process. And again, you can expect it to be exploited. You know, you notice that they're not creating those no-fly zones. NATO refuses to create the no-fly zones, which without the no-fly zones, Russia can continue to fly into Ukraine and bomb Ukraine, which is killing civilians, as we know now know. They're bombing hospitals and shit. Now, you put in the no-fly zone, the reason NATO doesn't want to do that because the only way to defend a no-fly zone is with military pilots. You know, you have to put jets in the air and bombers in the air. And so that means NATO has to get involved in the war in order to enforce the no-fly zone. And NATO and the U.S., they're not sure they want to do that yet because they don't know how far Putin is willing to go and they don't know exactly what's going on you see china talking tough on taiwan they're they're waiting they're they're i think they're trying they this could possibly be planned they could be trying to create weaknesses in the u.s in different regions so they can try to move in different regions to take control this could be the beginning of a very a much more complicated situation this could be, there could be a lot more global alliances happening right now than we even, even understand. Because Russia is operating very weird. They're not going in and clearing houses or anything like that, kicking down doors. They're just moving their convoys through, bombing, moving their convoys through, bombing. They're not really taking over neighborhoods or anything like that. So this is a very strange campaign that they're running that it really just seems that they're trying to occupy as much of it as they can and then what's the next step once you occupy then what hmm. you know you just say okay we proved our point and then leave like this was you know like a pump fake you know or, or what because now you, you you're you've already created you know you're you're Putin's a war criminal now you know, as much as he was disliked, now he's considered a war criminal. So it's different now. So if you're Putin, you can't, how do you just pull out and you can't go back to normal life, just normal Russia and just negotiate it out anymore. So this can't just be as simple as Russia, Ukraine. There's got to be more to this that's happening. But interesting enough, this conflict becomes complicated enough and it drags the U.S. into it then that starts becoming expensive for us at a time where China's whole focus is trying to take over that reserve currency. And so that creates another situation to where that could become a real world possibility. And that creates a very different dynamic in the world. Oh, it's a lot to take in. It's intense, man. Ukraine is a very intense issue. It's not simple at all. It's very, yeah. very, very complicated. And that's the thing, too, is like just with anything, it's like I just, whenever I see stuff, I just don't ever think I'm getting the full picture because I don't think we are. For sure. You know what I mean? Like, course, whether it's with the pandemic, whether what's going on. And I say this with all due respect to anyone who, has been negatively affected by this and or have lost their lives. But it's like, you know, when people come to me and are all heated and like, did you see blah, blah, blah? Did you see blah, blah, blah? I'm like, whoa, 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 calm down. What, 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 where did you see that CNN or Fox? <laughs> I'm just like, right. cause if it came right. from either of those sources, like I really, I'm not going to like take, uh, right. You got to check it. It's, it's biased. It's intentionally biased. Right. So it's like, and that's what I realized too. I'm just very cautious now on whatever I, you know, if you tell me the sky is blue, 
I'm going to go double check that. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. I'm going to go make sure. You sure it's okay? Oh, maybe it is blue, but it, it's, it's, we're, we're so gullible to the whatever information they feed us on anything. And that's why, yeah, you know, there's certain things. If an asteroid's about to hit the Southwest, of the United States, which would affect both of us in Vegas and Los Angeles. It's like, Oh yeah, I want to know that. <laughs> but it's at the right. same time too, though. It's like, but well, there's the facts, but then there's all the stuff they build around it and they spin it and they right. do this and do that. I just don't know what I'm listening or hearing anymore. So I, I've just kind of, they say you need to be informed. Okay. I agree. But at the same time, if you're getting your information from misinformation, it's like, it's, it's pointless because you're filling your right. head with stuff that isn't even what's real. Um, and how do you decipher and how do you sift through all that? And, that? and just tying it back in, it's like we the people do have the power to take control and start doing things and not wait for these people to some extent. Right. That's, that's really what I've been waking up to. It's like, why are we – like these people are – especially a lot of these politicians, man, and especially in the U.S., they're just a joke to me. Like they're a, a complete joke. I don't take well, any of them seriously. Like none right, of the them. clowns. Clowns, yeah. Just Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Both, all of them. And it's just like, you know, when you look at the wealth, uh, I have this book back here. It's called Whores. Uh, it's based upon, uh, I never even got past the first chapter, but it's based upon uh, like people that go into the Senate or Congress. And it just basically said like the second they get elected, they spend the next four years, 80% of their time is spent on raising money to get reelected <laughs> for the next election cycle. And just, yeah, I, I don't know. It's that. true. Yeah. It's true. And, and, and here's the deal. It's if you go into that position, really maybe 20, maybe 10% of the time you should be spending being reelected. Right. You should be rest of the time you should be spending working, solving the problem. And if you get elected or not, it doesn't, it shouldn't like, that shouldn't be your focus. You're, and, and it is, and it is what it is. And that's just the way the system works right now. And we need more people who are like, maybe see going into the Senate or the Congress is like, maybe restructuring it to where I'm a, uh, I work in operations for this digital analytics company. And I've, you know, gotten these accolades and understand this part of the economy, maybe in order to get into the executive level, I'll go and I'll run for Senate for four years and take my knowledge and in Senate for four years, pr provide my knowledge and work those systems. And if after those four years I get reelected, then maybe I'll take the reelection or not. But as a part of that experience, now I have an open door um, into the, into the executive team of this company, you know, like restructure to where it's a part of a process of evo evolution in someone's career as opposed to the, as opposed to the career goal uh, and trying to control that seat I like for their that. entire life. You know? I, I like that. And I'll, I'll add on to that too. I think, and this is just my opinion, you know, it's I think in this book too, and there's other things I've read, uh, uh, these people go in with a net worth of like nothing. And they leave and they're worth magically $15 million. I don't care what anyone yeah. says and call me a whatever. Like I'm for capitalism within reason, but that's bullshit. <laughs> it's like the right. leaders of the country should not have financial motive. I'm sorry. That should just be right. the rule. I'm just like, you shouldn't. Once you take that seat, you should be there because you're there to make the difference. You should have no financial interest in anything that you're making decisions off of and it should be and it should just be a natural thing like if you go in and you were a senator for four years and you come out and you know some you have your a business or something like that you get investors and you know maybe they're like oh you were a senator i trust your word sure. i'll invest in you i'm not against that that's yeah, perfectly either. fine but it shouldn't be built or guaranteed into the system while you're serving the politics because then that's going to just that's going to drive your decisions and that's when it becomes a problem yeah. 
Yeah, man. Man, this is definitely, uh, I think this is definitely going to be the most political pot. It's funny because I always usually tell people like, yo, we're not going to get into politics or that, but you're the perfect person to talk it with. <laughs> so hey, it's, not even it, it's hard not to go there with me because you know, I'm very like, I, I spend far too much time paying attention to it for sure. Well, and I feel like with this conversation, it's not even like, you're not saying like, choose this side or that side. You're like, no, look above it all. <laughs> like yeah, sure. look down at it and see like, yo, this is just, don't, that's not what's going on. Like whatever you think. Yeah. If you tap happen. into your personal humanity and you really just try to sit above it and just look at it for what it is, like you realize it's this, it's this, this fucking dumb game that we're all caught up in. And so much of it is just smoke and mirrors. That's just the reality that they, they want you to look, you know, look at the left hand while the right hand's doing something completely different. And in this time and place, because we're using technologies for this, these consequences of these changes and these things that are being done in the dark happen faster than they used to. So they do something, something happens, and next thing you know, we live in a completely different world like we do now. The, yeah. Nobody feels like they live on the same planet that they used to. No one. No one is experiencing life the way that they did before COVID. There was this feeling that we had of we we call it normality we know that's not the word we're looking for but i think that we all understand what we say when we say normal there was this normality we had back then that we no longer experience now none of us can put our finger on what that feeling or that thing or that specific security we had was before covid but it doesn't exist anymore and it's been replaced with this anxiety that is constantly felt by every single planet person on the planet. That's, that's our current reality. Facts. <laughs> Facts, man. And, uh, you know, we, we could go all night. Um, as we get toward the end here, I want to end on something. So tell me uh, real quick before I give you the last word, last word, what, what do you, what do you got besides the documentary? So what, what's all in the works for you? What do you, what's, what's up for a new day here in the next, the 2022 Man. for the rest of 2022 what's 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 your game plan so i got some land out in sierra leone um so i created a company called free world development uh we're going to be building out some logistics systems and agriculture and human waste out there in freetown sierra leone that is going to help them clean up their their environment get them some clean food so we can mitigate some disease clean up the environment so we have less of a mosquito issue and help them basically build their economy upon this platform. Um, and we really want to just serve in the process of serving them and helping them with their goal of becoming a, uh, basically a, a top tourist destination right there in Western Africa. So there's a lot of basically urban and agricultural development an infrastructure that needs to be taken care of. And there's some processes that have to happen for that to occur. Um, there's not a lot of companies or organizations that are stepping in and doing that. So I decided that I want to build that program, program out. So I'm going to be opening up an investment fund to get that taken care of. And I'm going to be doing a uh, public option, basically some public funding to basically help get that program off of the ground pretty soon so i'm pretty much just in the the, the strategy and logistics process of that getting that all written up getting my decks all done getting that all created um i'll be back over in sierra leone in a couple weeks uh basically going over doing a survey a final survey of the land figuring out where our specific facilities are going to be closing out some contracts and stuff like that so that's pretty much my main focus right now that's amazing, man. That's awesome work that you're doing. Yeah, man. It's a good time, man. It's good stuff. The great people over there. There's an amazing opportunity out there. And I think that, um, you know, there's, there's a dual side. We get to help the people and really give them an opportunity um, to live a, a modern life where they can experience the levels of health that we experience in America and, and not have to worry about, you know, clean water and disease. Uh, we're at a point now where these technologies solve these problems a lot easier than they used to. It's just a matter of getting people out there to do the work, to build the systems up. 
and um, and getting the funding for those those kind of things to happen. And then this also opens up uh, an opportunity for investment, you know, from from America. Um, I am really big on getting a lot of urban communities to jump into investment platforms, get investments. Um, that way, you know, there can be a relationship built between the African and the Black American community to bridge that gap. Um, so that's something that I've been working on as well and trying to influence that the best way that I can. Well, that's awesome, man. It really just sounds like you're on your purpose, man. Like you're on your purpose. Like you said, why are we here? It's like you're finding that thing, at least for the time being, you know, I'm sure there's going to be many more, but right now at this moment in time, you found, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this right here. And that's right. a beautiful, that's feels, for sure. that's a that's beautiful thing, man, because not many people I feel get to experience what you're doing right now. Like truly having that calling and just going all in with it and saying nothing else matters. This is what I'm doing and right. it's making a difference. So I really give you props for that. And before I give you the last word, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, follow you, uh, get a hold of you, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, IG really. I, I think my social media that I use the most is my IG. Uh, a new day the great. A N U D A the Great. A New Day the Great. Um, I think my Facebook is Joseph A New Day Bryant. My Twitter is A New Day the Great. Um, yeah, and that's really the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, also my email, a new day the great at gmail.com. I'll have a lot more information about free world development coming out. The website will come out soon and that will give a breakdown of all the different platforms from our recycling center, our, our water, water filtration uh, plant, um, our vertical farms and show all the possibilities for investments and everything like that. Dope, man. And I, uh, and we'll put the links in the description to all your handles and everything. Um, and what, cool. um, I, I always give the guests the last word. It can be as deep or as shallow as you want. It can be an idea. It can be a concept. It can be, it can be anything, man. It can be a joke. <laughs> uh, what do you want to leave us on? I think that more than ever in the times that we're going to be going through, that we need to lead with love. Ooh. We're in a very polarized society. We have all kinds of differences of opinion when it comes to politics, when it comes to, to sexual orientation and all of these things. And it's creating all of this division. And I think that when we interact with people, whether we agree with them or not, that we should always lead with love. Um, but also, when leading with love, it is important to also be capable of violence. Because if your enemy or your opponent is capable of violence or you're not capable of violence, then you risk not being able to protect yourself, not being able to protect your friends, your family, and if it comes to it, your nation. So always lead with love, but be capable of violence, especially in the world to come. All right, man. Well, uh, dude, a new day. Thank you. Uh, actually, real quick, it reminds me, I don't know what president it was. He said something like, I don't know, be still, but carry a big stick or something like that. I can't remember what. Uh, yes. Uh, Roosevelt or what, which one said that? I can't remember. I can't remember. Maybe it might have been Roosevelt. But yeah, something sim similar or even Bruce Lee. Be like water. You know, you have to be able to form to whatever circumstances that you're dealing with. Those circumstances may be full of love. Those circumstances may be full of violence. But you should be like water. Don't, you know, you don't cause, don't be the cause of the ripples. Just mm. be able to react to them and form to them. Yeah, man, I dig it. Well, in a, a new day, stick around for one second after I hit the re, uh, stop button. But, man, thank you so much for doing this, man. This has been far too thank long you, and way long overdue. We'll have to it's do it again. Long, man. Sure. Um, and I really, I really, I'm really happy, man. I'm really happy um, and impressed at everything you're doing. And I really think it's remarkable. Uh, you know, not only are you just finding this purpose, but I mean, you're helping a lot of people. 
in a place where it's really, it really gives perspective. Like the things we think are big deals or the things we get mad about, <laughs> they're, they're nothing to get mad about. Like these people need clean water and sewage systems yeah. and stuff that we don't give a second thought to. So right. do, doing the Lord's work, man, I really, uh, really happy for you. And I look forward to seeing where this journey takes you. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. All right, man. Till next time. Peace.